closer, you're about to see something really special. I really thought this part of my life was behind me. Frenzy disappeared with the drinking three years ago. Why now? This makes no sense, and I'm right on the verge of freaking out. Back from your life. These people can be animals. What you burn. Thingies out. Some bitter things mm. you should never good cheese. And remember, cosplay is not consent. So here's to me. Congratulations, me. Yay, me. This would all be so much easier if I was hammered. Mm. Hammered. You can take away the anger, but you leave behind the pain. It's your soul up here. New ventures are always scary. Blah, blah, blah. Something positive and uplifting. Don't miss our new film, The Love Song of William H. Shaw coming soon to a streaming service near you. Hey everyone, this is Cliff from Talking Pondo. Just wanted to give you a quick heads up about spoilers on the show. We do talk about the films in a certain amount of detail, so you may want to watch the film first and then come back if you're not a fan of spoilers. Um, also, every now and then there's a little bit of adult language, so we wanted to give you fair warning on that. We hope you enjoy the episode and we really appreciate you listening. Welcome to Season 2 of Making Pondo and Talking Pondo. Talking Pondo is a podcast where Cliff and Marty give each other a film to watch and talk about them in detail. Some episodes will include a special guest. Making Pondo is a podcast where Cliff and Marty talk to people they have worked with and discuss their experiences on set. All right, we're back. Here we go. Talking Pondo. <laughs> talking all day. Talking, talking. Pondo. Talking all day, talking all night. Been doing a lot of talking. A lot of talking. So, season, uh, season two? Season two, episode six, also known as episode 42, all together. Yes. For what it's worth, closing in on episode 50, closing on in the end of the year. But more importantly, Cliff has taken me back in time once again to what it feels like to be 12 years old. Because <laughs> I'm watching. Peanuts, and I'm watching Eddie Murphy be <laughs> Axel Foley, so we are going back in time pleasantly enough this week for that. It's our palate cleanser episode after all that horror and despair. Mm -hmm. We're giving you some it was a lighter fare. Well, there's there's still a lot of bloodshed in the uh, Beverly Hills Cop film, but it's it's not like Texas Chainsaw. So yeah, it's it's that it's that you know it's that action comedy violence that everybody you know so uh, we watched a boy named charlie brown which was my pick and right. uh it, we watched f. beverly hills beverly cop, hills cop. Axel, f. axel f That's right. a movie that uh was cliff's choice that just came out direct to netflix and i could tell why it was in the first minute but also it's one of those <laughs> movies where it feels like if you just if we put all these elements together and Say it's Beverly Hills Cop, it'll it'll turn into Beverly Hills Cop, right? 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 It, well, anyway, yeah, which one are we going to? Which one do you I mean, want to talk about it, first? It was Beverly Hills Cop. It, it, it is. is. As it much is. as you, as much as you love to bitch about the fact that, um, uh, what was the first of the of the the last trilogy of Star Wars movies? That one called. Uh, oh, it's one? much better than the Star Wars movies. No, no but you let, <laughs> but as much as you love to kind of harp on the fact that it's basically just remade Star Wars. It's just Star Wars remade. It's what they mm -hmm. did with, with with Ray. <clears throat> That's what Axel F was completely. Yeah. It was yeah. just fucking Beverly Hills Cop done kind of over again mm -hmm. i mean to the point where like they're really hammering on the nostalgia with the soundtrack yeah. right out the gate just yeah bam you that's know? what i'm saying if you throw all these elements together will it just turn into it and it's like well yeah the answer is yes but one of the reviews that i read that summed it up the best was if you want another amazing beverly hills cop movie this ain't it but if you just want another beverly hills cop movie well this is it um <laughs> 
Well, and I guess we should, since we're already diving into this one, we'll keep sticking. Yeah, why not? Let's one. start with that one. Um, so, made in 2024, uh, starring Eddie Murphy. Um, one of the things I'll give him credit for is that they got all the cast back, mm-hmm. um, which was really important. It was nice to see Jeffrey as, of course, the head of uh, police in it's Detroit, right? Um, yeah, it was giving me running scared flashbacks. Like, mm-hmm. what if these characters existed now? um and yeah exactly and uh you know it was nice to see um taggart and rosewood and yeah yeah you know all that like more rosewood they kept them out of the picture for a long time but yeah i would have liked more rosewood myself so um (laughs) that's a weird thing to say um (laughs) it's i like how he hasn't changed still the same old foley i felt like it, it felt very familiar very worn in and lived in um you know that opening sequence is like is kind of ridiculous like i love the setup where he's like no we came to a hockey game because you know we we like hockey and oh look here's some bad guys and oh you're lucky you're here i can't follow them i'm getting trouble right it's classic that's classic yeah, yeah. sort of axel foley mm-hmm. um but then getting away on the fucking quad bikes it turned into and this is where the beverly hills cop series in my opinion kind of in two and three and kind of lost its way where they overdid the action it's not lethal weapon it's james bond yeah yeah it's not lethal weapon it's not james bond it's axel foley he's he's Mm -hmm. a loud mouth he's kind of like a fletch with a little bit more action right right? Mm -hmm. but you know he's more on his wits than he is with the gun um, of course, you did have that big action sequence at the end where he gets shot in in where they you know in the house at Victor Maitland's house in the first one. But other than that, there was not a lot of violence. He's you know banana in the tailpipe, you know all this type of shit to do I mean, what he needs to do. Give us anything we haven't seen before. But, but, but by the second one, it's the gun club and it's all this stuff. And then the third mm-hmm. one's this ridiculous sort of third you know, one's crazy. I like how they're like not your finest yeah, hour. They even mentioned. yeah no shit. Um, and you know he's he had stated that the reason he wanted to do this movie was because th- three was so bad he didn't want to leave the character mm. like that and have that be the end of the series uh-huh. right and i do think that this it it redeems better. the series with this it's way better than three and but i would prefer to watch it over two honestly because yeah. it's funnier than two mm-hmm. but in ways i there's there's certain things about those two movies i like more than this one mm. Mm. I, I mean i like two two's got a kind of a slick sense to it i i, I hate three i i, I three's hate that it exists and yet it's it's bad but even though it's got our boy in it it's still terrible yeah. mm-hmm. this one i feel like wow i can't believe it took 30 years to make this movie and then it goes direct to streaming and it's like yeah hmm. i feel yeah. like the franchise like part four has probably always had a bit of a dark cloud around it so mm-hmm. when it finally comes out of course it's compromised direct-to-video but it seemed like this movie should have been a big theatrical with a large budget helmed by some hot shot director and a really good screenwriter and instead it's this australian guy i think this is his first big film actually mm-hmm. i mean like everything else was shorts and stuff and the writers were the guys who did that nicholas cage movie where he plays himself but they oh, were writing on top that's, of it. That's the, unbear- the unbearable weight of massive talent is a yeah, fucking so, great movie. So they're though, writing man. on top, I think, on top of a script that was written by the guy who does like Aquaman and some of those DC movies. Uh-huh. So it's a very bizarre talent pool that's yeah, making this, it, but they're trying a lot of new people on it, right? Like a lot of people getting their start in a way were given a chance on this rather than it's like, Back in yeah. the day, only somebody seasoned with a lot of money would have gone into this because Beverly Hills Cop would have been a big. Well, he—I mean, this director, this director hadn't done anything for five years directing-wise yeah. before he directed Axel F. So that's interesting. And so it's like you did a very good job considering. Did a great job. I but, thought he did because there's there is a lot of action sequences mm-hmm. and 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 stuff. You know, I mean, they're shooting in Beverly Hills. They're driving that little tripe, uh, that mm-hmm. little cart around, and and there's the car chases and other things. So that's pretty big for a, a for a, a big project for a guy. And I don't, I don't know. I still that's think the film impressive. is a victim of the pandemic. And what I mean by that is, if 
if this would have gone to the theaters, this would have been pushed as a big thing. I don't know mm-hmm. if, it, if the script mm-hmm. probably would have gotten polished a little bit more. Like, for instance, uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, I'm reading your file, Axel F. I know all about you. Wait a minute. He's your dad? Wouldn't it say that? Did one writer not communicate with the other writer? Did, was I missing something there? But, yeah, that's, uh, that was, you know, that's a good catch. Yeah, that I, was, I can that see that. a little odd. But uh, the weirdest thing to me was in the very beginning, so he's driving past those kids and he's like yeah. waving or whatever. I'm thinking, you're already down the street, man. They can't see you. And that was my first indication that something was very, very wrong with the driving scenes in this film. It's all digital projection like the Mandalorian. Oh, yeah. And it's fucking horrifying because it reminds me of old, it looks like Revenge of Zoe when Billy's driving to town in a way. So the pacing I, wrong, like the they're braking or driving not fast enough yet. Like eventually they'll figure this out. But in this movie, I just wish somebody had driven down the street with a camera. <laughs> it threw me out so bad. I was like, what is wrong with this? <gasps> it's a, digital projection they're not driving anywhere oh my god yeah and some of the scenes they did that i mean they didn't do it with everything but there was some digital you know what um, i mean right the pacing the, it's just it's the, the scene at the looking thing one of the things where it was really apparent to me was at the very end of the movie where he jumps into the back of the car yeah. where he's like you two are the worst surveillance team ever and it's like oh man that that looks yeah. like like that looks very bad green well, screen like beverly hills cop shouldn't have to yeah but it's corners to do that, right? It, but then again, it, I didn't see Coming to America Part Two either. So it it did its best to follow the formula of the first movie. It like did. It, it went it, back it, home it, again. It, it had it. It went. It went from okay incident in Detroit to you're in trouble, Foley, to L.A. to right into you know getting in trouble in L.A. and boom, boom, and, and kept moving. I I felt like it it. it really followed that formula very well um kevin bacon is a bad guy i didn't have a problem with at all i thought oh, yeah, that was kind of a fun right choice away. i'm like well he's the bad guy yeah <clears throat> of course <laughs> because he's I mean, slowly turning into gary cole you can you can tell that victor mayton you can tell that victor mayton was the bad guy right away too it's just now, you know kevin bacon and gary cole have never been in a movie together really That's so funny. are they the same person no but they are hub actors all roads lead to Gary Cole and Kevin Bacon. Um, I read that this movie took about 30 years to get made. Yeah. Um, that it was at one point in Brett Ratner's hands for four or five years that he was having scripts written and trying to get something going with it. He was because it was after Rush Hour 2009 when he was really hot. And then I, I heard that, you know, uh, Bruckheimer gave away the rights for a while, then got them back. Mm-hmm. And they could just never come up with a script and get people going. And I guess fi- finally Paramount just took a pass on the distribution deal and, and signed a deal with Netflix. This is the only Axel mm-hmm. Foley movie to not be distributed by Paramount. Yeah. And so it's, it's, uh, it's yeah, I'm very never- weird. I remember hearing they were doing auditions for it by tape a couple of years ago. So this mm-hmm. is one of those productions that it was already had that weird cloud around it. And then it got slowed down even more by, uh, by the pandemic. Well, they're already talking about part five. Yeah, you might as well. <laughs> but, you know, my only real note is just, don't do the digital projection for driving. Mm-hmm. Nobody drives like that. They're driving at the weirdest pace. And then they'll cut to one window and they'll they'll pull up and break. Cut to the other window, they're driving again. Cut to the other window, they're driving at a slightly slower pace. Cut to the other window, they are driving at a consistent pace that nobody has ever driven at in the history <laughs> of ever because they're shit in the road. And they're going straight for minutes on end. And it is so unnerving to me. One of the <laughs> weirdest things I've seen in a movie in a long time. I also I like that Kevin Bacon said chubby at one <clears> point. <throat> it gave me Bowfinger flashbacks. I was really hoping the movie would end with Eddie Murphy saying, gotcha, suckas. 
<laughs> um, oh, so um, <clears throat> the storyline of the movie. Let me read that real quick. Oh, yeah. Detective Axel Foley is up to his usual tricks in Detroit when Billy Rosewood, an L.A. private detective and longtime friend, contacts him for help. Foley's daughter, Jane Saunders, is a lawyer involved in a high-profile case and has been threatened. Foley sets off for Los Angeles, renewing many acquaintances and finding himself in the middle of a sinister conspiracy. As you do. As you do. I know what my last note here says. I couldn't make it out, but now I remember what it said. This movie felt like one of those latter-day Marx Brothers movies, like their 12th movie where they were so old they could barely move around and half the movie was stunt doubles. But it's still kind of amusing. Well, this movie's nowhere near that bad, but 60-some-year-old Eddie Murphy's not quite moving as fast as he did back in the day. But neither are his foes in this film either, so they keep him up against age-appropriate criminals. So that was fun, at least. Yeah. Um, it's no Top it's, Gun Maverick, but you it's know, gotta, if, yeah, if no. you're streaming, you, can, you could do worse. <laughs> yeah, Top Gun Maverick was, was a... I mean, we'll, we'll cover that eventually, but that was a surprisingly decent follow-up to Top Gun, especially surprisingly with so many years between the two of them. But, um, huh, yeah, Bronson, I, uh... Bronson Pinchot back again. Well, yeah, it was nice to see Pinchot back again, yep. Um, the Neutron Dance, uh, Heat is On, all the music from part one is represented. Yep. yep. Uh, shake down, take down. You're busted. I think that was in two, so they yeah. used that one. They used that one too. So unfortunately, we didn't get Chris Duncan beatboxing over Axel F, <laughs> which is an inside joke. But we did get somebody else doing a rap over Axel F in, in, in credits, a more modernized version. That's and, a, um, funny. That same guy did the Fletch music. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. 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 Luis Guzman. Harold Scott. Harold Faltermeyer. Harold Faltermeyer. <laughs> Uh, there's a Luis Guzman spotting in this, which is great. You, you know, he's, can't 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 hurt with a little Luis <clears throat> Guzman cameo. It was it was odd because it's like it's 2024, and this is how you kind of put that type of humor in the movie, right? It reminded me of the Star Wars Clone Wars movie when they go to that one hut boss who gives them the information. He's very flamboyant. Mm. <laughs> if you have a vague memory of that movie um i i thought it was funny that his name was chilino um mm -hmm. because there's a very popular string of mexican restaurants in oklahoma city called chilinos or at least they were popular they're not they're not popular anymore but during the 90s there was like five or six chilinos all across oklahoma city um but yeah anyway here but eddie murphy reminded me of the edited out scene of from our movie where Billy's at the AA meeting all because he's immediately yeah. gets all loud and starts clapping for Luis Guzman. It's funny how everybody looks older, but Eddie Murphy, he's like, we yeah. have the same age. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, did they purposely try to make him look younger or did they just realize that and make jokes out know. of it? Cause you get hints that he's doing a little free forming and parts, you know, like the yeah. Saunders thing felt, even if if that's in the script, then that's that's a testament to him, right? Yeah. Because it felt more like you know, mm -hmm. tags he, and on it. Stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's sixty three in the movie. I mean, not I don't know in the his character's age, but he's he like thirty one he, in part three, right? He's Something yeah, like he's six oh, yeah, he's sixty three years old and at this point in his career, wow. so I'd say he looks pretty good. Man, Taggart like looks from running Taggart's skills, guy. Man. Boy, he's he, he's re I, I I realized this the other day when I was, I was watching it. The cop tagger to me, since I was a kid, has always looked old. Yeah, since Breaking Away, right? Like yeah. he's just always looked old. Yeah, since and, and even in Breaking Away, he looks old. Mm -hmm. He just looks like he just looks like an old grown up in my entire life. I don't know how else to put it. Taggart you know? or Taggart? Taggart. Which one sounds better, Taggart? Or Taggart. There's no difference in that line is inspired by Beverly Hills Cop. Obviously. 
it, the original Beverly Hills Cop was so, what's the word, ubiquitous to our youth. When that thing came out in 1984, it was just, it was, it was everywhere. I mean, 48 was, Hours was a big was sleeper amazing. hit, but when that yeah. one hit, it was like that Eddie one Murphy was, mania. Yeah, he was huge at that point. Yep. Was that was his that perfect movie. four quadrant movie. The soundtrack was through the freaking roof. Through the freaking the roof. Instrumentals hitting the top ten. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Axel F was all over it. Yeah, that that song was huge. Plus the you, know, you had the Pointer <coughs> Sisters. You had all that other stuff. Yeah. And um, it was a good movie. It was yeah. a really good movie. What a career he's had, right? It's mm-hmm. interesting to look at his career as opposed to like. It's kind of similar to like Robin Williams in a way. Yeah. And he's, it, thankfully, Eddie Murphy's still around, but, you know, yeah. uh, you you go, oh, every now and then they let him make something like a Dream Girls or something where he doesn't have to play the goofy comedy thing, but then he always has to go back and make, you know, the, a couple of movies like this for the paycheck and stuff as well, you know. But every now and then they let him break the mold, you know. And that was yeah. Robin Williams too. For the most part, it was like one, you know, like here's another programmer, another Eddie Murphy programmer after another after another, and then like every fourth or fifth one, you get that kind of like, oh, that's the one that you could tell that that everybody kind of cared about. But yeah, I mean, like the, been making my name is for my name years, is so yeah. I thought you know my name is Dolomite was kind of like that. Oh yeah, where, yeah, right. You know, I was like, oh, that's you know, that's kind of a weird. Was like, that I like Netflix also. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, might have to might have to pull that onto the podcast at some point. Yeah. I was just watching it, sitting here thinking, like, oh yeah. yeah. Even if Robin Williams was still around, he'd still have to make goofball movies. Like three or four of those for every one serious one they let him do. Even though you've proven yourself time and again, there's still that money factor to show business. And if the movies don't generate the money, there's no money for anybody to make. Therefore, you mm-hmm. can't make the movie. I mean, I wish we could run it off of fandom alone. Shit, there'd be nothing but awesome shit. <laughs> but unfortunately, there's that show business aspect of it all the business aspect um they 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 followed the tropes very well in this like you have to have billy hold his badge up with his gun and say drop mm-hmm. your weapons mm-hmm. taggart has to have a shotgun and come in with a shotgun he has to get fully seat. yeah yeah fully has to get some sort of not superficial wound but nothing life-threatening at the same time you know mm-hmm. shot in the arm shot in the high shoulder you know, yeah. um, it, it just, it, it did it, you know, ex- I think it kind of did exactly what it was supposed to do. Um, and I, I felt like it was pretty successful. I, I think the second half had a problem. It dragged plot wise. Oh, I, I thought, watched it and I'm like, how has this only been this long? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, but I enjoy it. I, I enjoyed it. I, I, like I said, I, it, it, it gave me the more feeling of an original Beverly Hills cop mm-hmm. than the previous one did. And that was, I was yeah. very grateful for, cause it's like, fuck this, you know, like, cause I agree, Eddie, you can't go out on Beverly Hills cop three. You gotta no. do four, you know? And yet when I look back at two and three now, which I might actually want to rewatch, it's like, well, th- they're worse in ways. But they're better in, in ways, like I was mentioning. And I think it's primarily to do with how the films were constructed. There mm. wasn't CGI. There wasn't compromise. They just went out there and did all those crazy stunts and all, all that shit. Mm-hmm. You know? And so it's – and this one – I mean, obviously, I understand you have to do the CGI gunshots and stuff. But the weird shit like the driving and stuff where it's almost like made me sad in a way. And there's no Timothy Carhartt in this movie either. So – I mean, he's in part three, but you know, you, you can't fault a movie too bad for that. But you, you, overall, this one is prob- probably a better movie than part three. But part three at I, least was a big. I feel movie. like part three really lost it, lost its way. Yeah. With, with with what Beverly Hills Cop was, and I do know, feel and like it, watching it again just to see, you know, 
Yeah. Do they reference it at all? Because I haven't seen it in a while. Maybe if I had watched all three before, maybe I'd be like, oh shit, they're referencing part three a little more and I didn't catch it or something. I don't know. I don't I don't remember any part three references but other than the nineteen ninety four incident. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Um, at one point I read that, uh, Murphy was trying to shop it as a television series and, and he would, too. and he would be, he would be the chief of police in Detroit and there would be a new, his, like his son or his grandson or somebody would be, or somebody else would be the new Axel F in the department. Mm-hmm. And it would, the show would focus on that person and he would just kind of be coming in and out of the show here and there, which I thought was kind of an interesting yeah. concept. It's, it's <clears throat> so trippy and bizarre to make a Beverly Hills Cop movie in 2024 and yet there it is and it works for what it is and people Mm -hmm. always like to say you couldn't make that now well they did there Mm -hmm. it is and that's the version of it for now (laughs) and if it gets people interested in watching the originals then there you go we just watched part one on our film festival trip a few months ago. And yeah. so that was the most recent time I'd seen that one. Yeah. So I was glad I at least had that fresh in my head. Cause mm-hmm. I guess all you really need is part one going into this shit. If you've never seen any of them, you can start here if you want. I think that's the idea yeah, for it, the new generation. It, it does also does a very good job of standing alone to a certain mm-hmm. extent. Like, it, I mean, you would have to kind of explain who Billy and Taggart are and what that backstory is a bit more, but if it was really standalone, but I think, yeah, I think you could probably watch it and enjoy it without needing to know much more than, you know, Oh, they have some sort of history together and so on and so forth, you know? Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, Yeah. Anything else you want to talk to say about it? It doesn't really, suffer from you know what the force awakens did to legacy sequels this one's more in line with like a top gun maverick and what i mean by that is they're trying to just make it more like the original movie and not really change a whole Mm. lot to modernize it they reflect on a few things here and there but the movie as it is now it's almost like the same movie again just with older people in it yeah this version is a direct video version. And it's really weird for me as having grown up with these movies to be like, part four, direct video Of course, that means something different now. You know, they were, they were testing with streaming movies before the pandemic. Wasn't there a movie called Bright that went direct to Netflix? Yeah, that was and, that one. That, that was a terrible fucking movie. And I think it still did okay on the platform. I th- well, people, yeah, people tuned into it, but immediately, you know, I think I think the actual viewership numbers dropped pretty quickly because mm-hmm. people found out it wasn't very good. I watched it. And so they it were already not very good. They were dipping their toe into streaming new movies back then. So it makes you wonder if there hadn't been a pandemic and theaters had continued to operate, would they have done a more slower dive into figuring out what streaming mm-hmm. is instead of going into it and then the whole business is upside down and then Beverly Hills Cop 4 suffers from it because I feel like it just deserved a much larger budget. I think that I don't I don't think there was as much digital but, as you think there was, but but, but I but I, I do I do hear what you're saying that you didn't like the the overall look of the film. Yeah, um, I felt like it, uh, it was uh, and that's 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 valid. Yeah. Um, I didn't, I didn't really, yeah, I didn't really have much of that problem with it. Again, you could you could see the digital here and there. Um, I did think that the some of the helicopter some of the helicopter stunts they did were pretty fucking. Oh, wild. see, that stuff's great. It's just um, the odd driving. You're, we're yeah. gonna look at this in thirty years, and it's gonna be like the weird projection in movies from the fifties. It's like, oh, that's not right at all. <laughs> so give it a few more years and then they'll they'll get it to where it feels right. But this is going to be one of those like 1997 CGI where people are just like, oh, <laughs> I you see, liked it I, at the time. Yeah, for me, I I don't know. I guess I'm just old school, but I, I like if you can do a practical effect and do it, do a practical effect, do a practical effect. Of course, every every fucking time, and and in fact, I you know I, I I 
if you can stay away from CGI graphics, it's like that um, that computer generated image of of New York and Escape from New York that comes on the screen and all that shit. That's all just that's just a map with tape lines on it that they shot with cameras. Yeah. And, and that's not even fucking that's not even computer generated, right? It just looks like it is. Right. They get away with it, right? And to me, that shit it's it it not only looks better on screen, the effect lasts mm-hmm. and plays forever. And mild CGs on that, you know. Mild, I mean, yeah, I, I, I hear you, but w- w- compared to what what we're talking about now with CGI and parallax and all this shit, that's just, uh, that you might as well have been hand handmade on that. And that's know? why it's just, it, it made me sad in a way where it's like, fuck, Beverly Hills Cop should be sh- at least shooting the, the car scenes <laughs> outside or something you shouldn't have to just because we can doesn't mean we should right it felt like well we can just do all this stuff here because we're doing everything else with the explosions and stuff it's like no that's that's important too to me yeah that's that's hollywood we're all about could and not shoulda that's that's definitely science and hollywood yeah we're all about coulda not shoulda to quote bat to quote bat nozzle um, but all having said all that, I'm going to give it two and a half stars because I enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. You're more forgiving than I am. I gave it one and a half. Whew, the last, the last third was, was it took the last third was probably, uh, the part that probably needed the most polishing, but, mm-hmm. uh, I, I thought the first third and, and the parts with Serge were hilarious. Um, you know, I thought there was some fun stuff in there. Yeah, it's worth watching, but my my rating is as low as it is because it didn't really show us anything we haven't seen in a movie before. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's true. It's just that's the very Beverly true. Hills Cop programmer, and that's fine if you want just that. But I was hoping for a I, little something. I only again, laughed out loud like once or something, and I think it was when he was telling him, "You can't call black folks that," you know. <laughs> Oh, or he, well, really? I like the whole part where he's like, oh yeah, it's in the, the black, the, the black, uh, the, you know, the black hockey league from back in the day. And he's like, oh, what? Yeah. There's a black hockey league. What? And, you know, I didn't know that you like, you like, oh, so you say you love hockey, but you didn't know there's a black hockey league and promising beginning, you know, and, and laughs here and there, you know, I wish a, they it, leaned a little more into that of it. You know, there's just sprinkles yeah. of that humor in there. Yeah. But, I hear you. The whole movie could have been that in a larger theatrical spectacle and then it could have been like holy shit could have been like top gun maverick where you're just like Mm -hmm. oh shit that was awesome that was hilarious but hey it finally happened beverly hills top four it exists now i mean i think it's again better than three and 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 to me to (laughs) me redeeming the series yeah that's uh you know, because now we're going to get a five. They're now already in talks five. to do a five. Like die hard. Well, it just keeps mm-hmm. going and going and going. Hell yeah, yeah. Well, why the fuck not, man? Till till the till the returns are so diminishing that you can't make any money off it. It's the Roger mm-hmm. Corman method. Yeah. yeah, that's all anybody seems to do anymore. Well, I mean, that's Hollywood scared to death to do anything that isn't a known pr- product, dude. It's I don't I don't know what happened because it's like. During the 70s, it, it was like all – it was all rebel filmmakers, right? Like the studio had no idea what to make, and they let all these Mavericks make these crazy-ass movies that, that – and then once they hit and, and did well, you know, um, uh, Hopper does Easy Rider. You know, you get got The Godfather in there. You get you know all these other filmmakers coming out making these movies, um, Mean Streets, Taxi Driver. Oh, okay let's just let the artists make the art and we'll just benefit mm-hmm. reap the benefits then here come the 80s and the kids and and the next generation that's been been you know kind of influenced by that become some of the greatest filmmakers in my opinion of all time spielberg's and Mechas, all these others you know along with their peers of you know and then you get to the 90s and the, and, and it's it then it's really about the indie filmmakers and looking for the next generation and and, and kind of going against the need to make these bloated hundred million dollar Terminator two movies. And then it gets into the aughts and it just, it starts <laughs> to, it starts to die and it becomes, it becomes all about the trilogies and the, and the, you know, how many fucking Jason movies can we make? How many Freddie movies can we make? 
can we, you know, how many Blair witches can we make? How many of these can we make? Right. And to, to where now the whole system is all they want to do is just Everything make, make alive. movies based on shit that they know is going to sell. They're not, they don't want to take any chances on anything. Serialized endless stories, which is why most TV shows, I was, was talking with Adrian about this a little while ago. Most TV shows end with just, it just stops. It's this shitty no re- resolution because <laughs> oh yeah, the network just gave up on it. Yeah. Because not everything can survive, you know, something's going to get canceled, but yeah, yeah. It, that's, that's what happens. That's why it's, it's so hard for me to get invested in TV shows until I know that they've been around for a while. And even that, a show can be on for a long time and still have a not satisfactory mm-hmm. ending because yeah. you know, it just yeah. stopped because it's all serialized to never yeah. end to keep you coming back over and over. Your well, you, your Grey's Anatomy, your mm-hmm. super, Supernatural, 15 and seasons. I mean, look, of you can do a lot of good stuff in there. You can do a lot of long-term storytelling mm-hmm. if you're yeah. really allowed to do it. It's you know stuff you can't do in film, but it's walking, the, walking dead with its ridiculous it's, it's amount of off. Yeah, where you're just left going, what the fuck? I love season yeah. one. Season two yeah. was five episodes, and it went to shit because they changed the showrunner. And this happens over and over again. Well, and I mean, Sopranos was, you know, Game of Thrones, two of the biggest letdowns in television history. Two of the biggest letdowns in endings. Right. In See, there's that perfect example of it. Yeah. But we're but we're talking movies. We're not talking television. Life is a series of down endings. Yeah. Well, it all Life is a series of down Beverly endings. Cop because <laughs> Beverly Hills Cop is talking about, you know, part four. We're talking about franchises and the serialization yeah. nature and how we true. got to this point over the last four true. years. So it, yeah, that's true. It's relevant. It's, it's all tied together, yeah. It's all tied together. But yeah, um, our second movie is uh, is the palate cleanser for all the dark horror movies that we had to watch. But but also, year. funnily enough, was serialized to death. Well, yeah, because it's a comic strip, which is the uh-huh. nature of serialization. Uh-huh. But this is... Uh, a boy named Charlie Brown from 1969 and Peanuts, mm-hmm. the comic strip, started in 1950. So right. it took them 19 years to get to a feature film. Yeah, they'd had about a half dozen uh, TV specials before this movie, already mm-hmm. nailing their classics. Christmas, Great Pumpkin, and then this movie comes out. So uh, it's kind of like did, a perfect distillation did. of comic strip in film form in that way it hadn't they been... did their they did race for your life and all those others before this oh no those are the other theatrical movies I, they did a about a half dozen of their tv specials which was what great know. great pumpkin yeah those those little half hour ones with the dolly oh, madison okay. commercials they'd show yearly on tv but this oh, was yeah, the first yeah, okay. theatrical. Like this one, to, you had to go. Oh, I'm gonna go see the Peanuts gang on the big screen now. So, so the storyline, which doesn't um, happen for about a half hour, because we have to learn how miserable Charlie Brown is before. <laughs> <laughs> the perennial failure. Charlie Brown attends the National Spelling Bee and manages the worst Sandlot team in the history of baseball. Linus loses and retrieves his security blanket. Snoopy the Beagle dances wildly and plays shortstop. The irascible Lucy Van Pelt tricks Charlie Brown into kicking the football, but at the last minute she pulls it back and sends him flying onto his back. Mm -hmm. And although he loses the spelling bee, his friends gladly welcome Charlie Brown back to town upon his return. And uh, features nearly two dozen songs and a talented voice cast. Yeah, it's kind Um, of like if you were reading this in strip form, You'd read, you know, like a week's worth of one story, and then the next week would be about where's Linus's blanket, and then you know they kind it's, of bounce. It's back very much, like yeah, it's very much like a, you know, in cart. Oh my goodness, how to explain this? I don't know if the Peanuts did this, but I want to say they may have. But you know, cartoonists they do a weekly strip, and then they have a big Sunday strip. Yeah, yeah, the big right? Sunday. The color and one. usually they, you know, Calvin and Hobbes, that's type, you, you know, you, you tie a story together and then culminate, you're started on a Sunday or culminated on a mm-hmm. Sunday. And the peanuts that the, these early on in these, these vignettes that he's doing in the, sh- in the movie feels very much like that. He's taking the best of each of those uh, Sunday culminations and going, all right, let's do the, uh, let's do the dandelions on the, on the pitcher's mound and, 
you know, hey, Charlie Brown, if you can't get your clothes on fast enough, we're going to have to call the game because you keep getting your clothes knocked off. <laughs> you know, that, and then we'll do that whole thing. Then we'll, then we'll switch over to, you know, uh, feeding the dog and Snoopy and all that type of stuff. And then we'll switch over to the psychiatrist and the football. And then we'll switch over to uh, Schroeder and his thing and Linus and the blanket, you know. Mm-hmm. And then we'll start the actual spelling we'll bee the story. story. Yeah. Right. Um, this movie did what a lot of the same thing. Yeah. yeah, this this movie did what it, I and I was expecting it. I hadn't seen this in a very long time, so I didn't remember it hardly at all. But this movie did what a lot of movies in the '60s and the '70s that were animated did, where it would just kind of wander off story into mm-hmm. a into a visual trip fest. Yeah, that's and you're just part. like with a song and shit, and you're just like, okay, this I knew this was coming. Here uh-huh. we go. Here we go. Um, it yeah, was uh, the trippiest I, of them, yeah. Yeah, I couldn't help but think if you were on some some good psychedelics, you in the '60s, you probably would have yeah. gone to see that and quite enjoyed yourself. Yeah. By the time you get to '72, Snoopy Come Home, it's it's more subdued, and mm-hmm. then the last two Race for Your Life and Bon Voyage, they're not really psychedelic. They're at just all. yeah, they're just home. straight up animated. Yeah, yeah, movies. Yeah. But back here, this is before Woodstock was a character. There's no Franklin. There's no Peppermint Patty. So Pig oh, she's Pen no Peppermint gets, Patty's in there. So Pigpen gets to play a a lot of background Pig, instead. Pigpen's in there. Peppermint Patty's in there. She's listed in the movie. Really? Yeah, I be, I'm pretty sure. Well, let I me know, double check the let I me double check the credits because I, I could have sworn right? I saw that she was referenced in like a group. Yeah, Sally Dreyer does Patty. She's just well, not called Pepper. She's just not called Peppermint Patty. That's another character. That's like Violet and Patty, those original. Oh, because um, she looked like Patty. Yeah, she's the other, those two ones that are, you know, always picking on Charlie um, Brown with Lucy and singing that horrible song to him. Where yes. It's like, wow, shaming in the 60s. No wonder we Terrible. did this. Look, we're watching the movie where it's, it's accepted. But think mm-hmm. about it, though. Lucy's really mean, but Charlie Brown and Linus are pretty fucking insufferable. So I mean, it yeah, kind I of mean, it goes hand in hand, right? You know, it's it's hard after a while to feel bad for Charlie Brown when the dude is such a freaking bummer. It's like, yeah. dude, yeah, he needs he, yeah. he's very depressed. Even Linus is like, come on, just be positive. Eventually, it'll work out for yeah. you. And Linus is just completely addicted to his blanket, you know. Oh, oh God. <laughs> it's crazy. That thing's like the Doctor Strange's cloak. You know, yeah, got... why would he give it to Charlie Brown at all? <laughs> I don't you, think you know you're, you're just gonna you know you're just gonna be jonesing for your fucking heroin in a day or two. What are you doing? And so then Charlie Brown's like, I don't even know what happened to your blanket. <laughs> and it's like he, so it's one of two things. He either is gaslighting Linus because he doesn't give a shit. Like he knows <laughs> where the blanket is. Or two... He's just thinking, fuck you, Linus. Fuck you and fuck your blanket, right? you motherfucker. <laughs> that might actually be what it is, actually. But it might have, that's why I always think this is definitely for adults, too, because there's shit that goes right over kids' heads in this. It's sure. Especially these older ones. Sure. Uh, but I also think it, it, what it might be is Charlie Brown don't give a shit about anybody. He's not paying attention to any details. You think he would know what Linus's blanket looks like after all this time? No, he don't know. He just well, he's just in his shoes with it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's he is in the middle of trying to win a spelling bee, and he's well, going to be on TV, true. so he's got a lot going on. He does have time. a lot going on. That is the excuse. Yeah, yeah he's absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, this is, this is, you know, this is classic. It's got all of the early classic peanuts tropes. Um, like, like we, like I talked about, um, my favorite being my, and I, I I remember now really loving Schroeder playing classical. I love that as a kid and I love Snoopy and the Red Baron stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. And so you get that early Snoopy and the Red Baron with his dreams and shit, and that was great. I just yeah. I, I, ate, I ate that up. And the Schroeder part is probably the trippiest part in the whole movie. Yeah, it I is. Like, well, I'm watching Yellow Submarine for a second almost. Yeah, ex- that's my thought exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, I like um, how it opens up the world of peanuts a bit. They're walking through the neighborhood, house to house, and then they walk up to the what we call the peanuts wall, and then they stand by it. And I'm like, oh, so that's what it looks like walking up to that little brick wall where they always stand at. It's just kind of neat how they use yeah. the widescreen. And he keeps talking about, I don't want to see my uh, problems projected onto a big screen. I'm like, well, that's what the movie is. You know, we're seeing you on the big screen now, so meta in that respect yeah yeah sorry i feel like you were gonna say no oh no 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 i i i uh um i I mean i have a few notes um you know like i said i i get that that's the shtick that's charlie bounds kind of shtick but that I, i that downer sort of attitude kind of get, can get a little tiring. Yeah, and this like, is for kids. Yeah. And this is for yeah, kids, especially for adults. Um, <laughs> uh, Lucy Van Pelt is a, a absolute fucking sociopath as, oh, yeah. as a child. And, and I'm sure she grows up to be in a woman's prison somewhere after having <laughs> probably killed some dude and forged a bunch of fucking checks in his name or something. And I also realized Charlie Brown doesn't deserve to get kicked the football. <laughs> After all these years, I've come to that conclusion. Like, yeah, you know. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I was a little bit disappointed there was no more, there was no, I, I mean, can we, we can agree Peppermint Patty's lesbian, right? Like, that's that's kind of the, like, with a, I mean, with the, there's, with there's the, innuendo, but there's. There's, um, or was she just kind of sporty? Well, they're they probably her and Marcy. I mean, obviously, yeah. the comic. I don't. I'm not. I'm not trying to there, imply that the two of them were going out, but I if, just. I, if you look, if you look at it just as a story, it does appear that there might be some buy going yeah. on. Yeah, but there's like, no. But there's no. Really, one way or the other, but it might be yeah. more of a. More complicated yeah. than that. Yeah. Yeah, I hear one you. of the okay. latter, one of the latter theatrical movies, Marcy gets a boyfriend. Right, right. I, okay. I don't think Peppermint Patty responds too well to it. Um, from what I remember, that might be the uh, Race for Your Life movie. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder if that has anything to do or coincide at all with. Um, I read. I saw a documentary where. Um, Apparently, he was very good friends with Billie Jean King. Um, really? Yeah, I, I I saw a documentary on her on her on her tennis career, and and she met him, I guess, during the time when she was going through the whole thing with um, uh, Bobby Riggs and all that type of thing, mm-hmm. and trying to and fighting to get you know equal pay and shit like that. Um, that she met him somehow, and I think she called him Sparky. Makes I want to say was I think he nickname, was in tennis, yeah, yeah, nickname that she had for his him. nickname, yeah, yeah, and she so she talked a lot about him affectionately and and what a great guy he was and what a good he really helped her. Not, I don't know, I don't, I can't remember, and I don't want to uh, assign anything to it. Right. But I, I, what I remember is he kind of helped her kind of be her true self, or at least kind of mm. uh, fight the fights that she was fighting. And mm-hmm. so I thought that was interesting. I don't know. I'm not saying that peppermint patty and that type of thing has anything to do with it. I wonder right. if that's all. He was very maybe, progressive though. You know? Yeah. He, maybe it's all exactly. Maybe it's all tight. He's seeing it happen in real life and he starts to put it into his art. Maybe. Type of thing. I don't know. Cause there's never, nothing is ever out. Right. But right. It's like we talk about with intentional fallacy and subtext and mm-hmm. it's, it goes back to chasing Amy and the Archie conversation, right? We're going to go across the street and stack Archie's, you know? Right. <laughs> It's something to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. I, I it could be Bon Voyage Charlie Brown where Marcy gets a boyfriend. Yeah. Yeah. I'd have to look more into it and maybe, <laughs> maybe dig into that. I haven't, I don't know much about Schultz's life or his personal, you know, um, his, you know, why he created certain characters the way he did or, or, or moved on, you know. Um, it's interesting that, uh, do you, oh, go, go ahead. I'll, I'll say my thought on here. No. Um, I, that was, I was, uh, yeah, I think that was it. Oh, okay. Uh, I think it's interesting that they get their first theatrical film almost 20 years into the strip's existence, which is probably perfect time because they've had enough time to saturate. People know what it is, you know, and it's ready to come out. And then you get basically three more theatrical 
Peanuts movies in the 70s. And I'm thinking, oh, that 70s must have been when they were at their height of popularity. 20 mm -hmm. to 30 years of their run. They're starting to put the toys in stores, which is convinced the modern bookstore. There'd probably be no Amazon.com without the Peanuts, if you really think about it. And uh, then after you get through the three movies, Bon Voyage is in 1980. And uh -huh. so now we go into the 80s and they're still popular, but you're starting to get things like Flash Beagle and it's starting to drop off a little bit until <clears throat> inevitably yeah. in the year 2000, it stops at 50 years of production. It made me think the other night, maybe this is the fate of The Simpsons. 50 yeah. years, and then it'll just disappear into the, e in the evening, and no one will even notice. And occasionally, it'll, it'll pop up here and there, because it's always going to be there. But that will be its run, because the last of the people who got the nostalgia from the people who already had nostalgia have come and gone, and then it just runs its course. And I bet all mm -hmm. those other animated shows will follow course. In about 2040. So let's let's see if I'm correct on that. But that's what the made me think that yeah, the peanuts were incredibly popular in the 70s, right? Didn't it seem like they were everywhere. Oh god, yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. They were huge. Um, yeah, um, yeah. They were they were freaking huge. Uh, I remember them being all over. Um, I mean, I had a. And Woodstock, especially at that point, was very big. Snoopy and yeah. Woodstock were, I think, were probably carrying the peanuts mostly mm -hmm. at that point. Yeah, and this is like right before Woodstock, because 69, and that's where mm -hmm. that character's name comes from. But yeah, they were, that duo was, shh. I mean, he, he'd been doing the strip for over 20 years, and then he strikes gold with Woodstock. Yeah. Talk about yeah. fucking... And, you bring a new character into a TV show or something later on, you, people hate that shit. You bring this little yellow bird in there and boom. Yep. Through the fucking roof. And then Peppermint Patty, Marcy, Franklin. There were still a few other newer characters that he introduced that still ended up getting more and more popular. Yeah, so that's, I'm, I'm, I'm quickly like perusing. Park, I guess, huh? I'm quickly perusing an NPR article and, and I, I kind of got it right. Sort of. Um, he was a big proponent of tile nine. He became a friend of Billie Jean King's. He, he actually included her in the strips at some certain points. Mm. And he created peppermint Patty to be, uh, 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 she's the best athlete. She's basically like a, a, you know, girl jock playing sports and all that type of thing. Um, and he did that I think I remember because that he, one. yeah, he wanted to um, add clout to Title IX, which you know is Title IX is all about bringing equality in sports for for women. Um, so that's that's an interesting, yeah, yeah, because you know everybody bought the newspaper back then, and so everybody read the funny pages, and so Peanuts was really a part of people's lives as much as any of those other strips were back then in that mm -hmm. pre-internet world. Mm hmm. What I really yeah. liked about this movie was the old school cell animation. You know, it's uh, been a while since done. yeah, it's been a while since I'd seen an actual fucking hand drawn animated movie, so that was really kind of nice. I appreciate that craft, you know. Mm -hmm. And the, you could tell they stepped it up from the TV specials because they're like, okay, this is the one going to the, the theaters now, so we're gonna we're gonna try some things. We're going to experiment mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah, no, it, 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 it looked great. I mean, it, it like I said, it, it kind of, it kind of takes like, like you're always going to know. Um, mm -hmm. it, Movies it, between it, 68 and 80 assume you're on acid. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. It's going to wander here and there. It's going to give you pretty things to look at. It's always going to have a musical number or two that ha that isn't, about moving the story along or anything it's just right. you know it's just a diversion yeah total frippery yeah mm -hmm. just you're just adding time and yet um, you can chop it into like three half hour segments kind of perfectly you know charlie mm -hmm. brown's depressed charlie brown's in the spelling bee and then charlie brown's coming back you know how dark 
it, shit, I'm, I'm talking about giving you a light movie. How dark is it after he comes in second place, which is not bad in the right. Spoon B, and they fucking turn on him like he's a piece <laughs> of shit. But that's how you would shame people back then. It was normal. Yeah. And he rides home all by himself. Yep. He gets in the bed, and he's just sitting there in the dark. Just yep. And it's yep. like, oh, my God. I know. The I know. And he, of it all. <laughs> well, and, you know, you, pe- people talk about social anxiety now, dude. I mean, the, social anxiety was so bad when we were kids that it would just keep you from trying something. Mm-hmm. You would just be like, if I, if I can't be the best in school at it, there's no point in even trying it because I'm not going to come in second or third and get laughed at or fifth. Yeah. You know, you know, the fear of getting laughed at was like paralyzing. Uh, I'm laugh at you. <laughs> and these kids are all assholes. They're all just terrible. Oh, they're terrible. And Charlie Brown's um, terrible too. Mm-hmm. And, and and Snoopy hates him. Snoopy loves him, but he hates him. He mostly yep. wants to get fed. <laughs> yep. <laughs> he puts up with Charlie Brown, is what I should say. We learn more about that in the sequel when he leaves. When Snoopy goes on his little adventure, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What doesn't somebody say? Charlie Brown Esquire, and doesn't Esquire mean lawyer? Probably. I mean, and if Snoopy's that... becoming his high-powered agent that wants ten percent of him, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> um, she's like it's Jerry Maguire all over again. She's one of the bad agents, you know. Mm-hmm. She's not a booster for you know. It's it's slightly help subversive. Me to help you. It's it's got some slightly subversive stuff in there, especially for the time. Um, right. Ice skating Snoopy has always been a fave of mine too. I love that. Mm-hmm. Um, they usually get they try- a lot of the subversive lines. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Because she's the innocent one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, I like the Snoopy skating diversion too. That's another one of those just. Yeah. You just go on yeah. a little thing for a few minutes. What was I watching? Yeah. yeah. It's like the Red Baron thing. It's really kind of, it's mm-hmm. fun. It's It has nothing to do with the story or anything, but it's this nice, fun diversion. Um, it's an indulgent movie. I mean, it wanders. It kind of lingers. It doesn't really have much of a plot. Yeah, they didn't know how really, to make a 90-minute structure yet. Yeah. No, but it's still super charming mm-hmm. and super engaging. Yeah. Like it's I I can see why people like it. Um I absolutely it was like like you said it's it was a great palate cleanser after all those uh, <laughs> after all the horror movies it really was. It was nice to like shit I hadn't seen this since I was a little kid. Yeah. And surprisingly it still really holds up for for an older viewer. Mm-hmm. Like it's not especially once you get past the first 20 minutes. Yeah. Like but when we got to the end I was like, "Oh shit, it's over?" Like oh okay well mm-hmm. fuck because it was it went it you know it really it moved really well it was yeah. fun I enjoyed it. Um, one of my notes is someone find this kid his fucking blanket already. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, that was that was a uh, reminds me of some of the other movies we've watched where they've leaned into one particular person screaming the same thing <laughs> too many times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. The, but when he gets the blanket and he does that dance, I was laughing. That was really oh, yeah. funny. Um, it has that early tech. I don't know what to call it. Um, do you remember the Lord of the Rings movie from the seventies? And I think Bashki did it. Yeah. In Wizards, where they take where they would animate over live oh, action so that they had the tracing over the they line. had shot and then Rotor yeah tracing. rotoscoping. Yeah, was that what it was? I think that's the term for it. But it, it had some of that where you could see live people at certain parts moving around and then mm-hmm. they had drawn over it, especially during, I think, the um, the Schroeder stuff. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, they were probably experimenting with some of those different mm-hmm. animation techniques. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was interesting. It was good. Yeah, it has – it starts like Boyhood. That shot of him is laying in the grass just, you know, <laughs> up at the sky. And I'm like, that's kind of perfect. Uh, and you know it's true. If you learn these rules, you can spell well, you without say, anything. You should say boyhood. Boyhood starts like this, That's right? Because boyhood this starts like boyhood. a boy named Charlie Brown. Mm-hmm. And the song implies that 
all these kids are going to grow up. I don't think Rob McEwen understands peanuts. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's true. If you learn these rules, you can spell just about anything. Of their little song about, you know, and they go through all the different words, including codeine and things. But it seems weird, but it's because of the way they're spelled. And I think I even learned something about there was only three words that ended in E-D-E, right? <laughs> right. And it's like, hey, that's right. You know, I never thought of it that way. Or C-E-D-E, right? Yeah, C-E-D-E. You, see, you think I should pay more attention to this movie? I could, you know, C-E-D-E. be an expert speller. Uh, the, there's fourth wall breaks. And then there's fourth wall breaks that are done as the thoughts as well. So I thought that was kind of interesting. You know, the fourth wall break is continuing and Charlie Brown is talking to the audience through his thoughts. <laughs> mm. So mm. it's just like, oh, a level on top of a level. Mm -hmm. It's a ninth wall break. Mm -hmm. And then I said, yes, this is all pre-Woodstock and Schroeder's trip was one of my notes. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I mean, out of the four movies they made, and there's that fifth movie, the Pixar-ish one, which is okay. Uh, I think this is the best of the original movies because they it starts to become a little diminishing returns. They start feeling like longer specials. Those, they're still fun, but there's nothing quite as interesting as this relic from 1969 with its little tangents that it goes on and its, it's weird psychedelic trips and and teaching you how to be a better speller at the same time. <laughs> I um, I enjoy it. Um, I, I I really thought it was good. Um, I I I <laughs> I didn't remember it being as kind of harsh in certain ways as it was. You know, <laughs> like they really shit on Charlie Brown and he really shits on himself. Um, but at the same time. Uh, it's really well done. It's yeah. like I said, it's charming and it's engaging. It's funny. Um, it, it, in, in parts where it really needs to be funny. Mm -hmm. um, I think kids and adults could still watch this today. There's sure for each, you know. Yeah, I mean it's an it's an older type of of, of you know storytelling, but you know I kids love cartoons. They'll watch it. You know, any, any kid yeah. under ten years will watch any cartoon you put yeah. in front of them probably. And there's something. So, Weird. I think they probably yeah, enjoy it. The peanuts have always had. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Oh, what were you saying about you think you could put you could put it in uh, front of a kid or? Yeah, like I said, I think you could put it in front of a kid now, and I think you probably enjoy it. I think. Um, yeah, like I said, it's different. It's not like you know, Boss Baby or Shrek. But at the same time, it's it's interesting enough and it's weird enough that I think kids will get it yeah. and enjoy it, you know. And in the end, there is a sort of a a weird friendship amongst all those kids, you mm -hmm. know, even with little sociopath Lucy running around and weird ass Linus in his blanket and you know Charlie Brown's sister who has the hots for Linus won't leave him alone, and, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's good stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to give it two and a half. It's not like the most amazing thing in the world, but it's it's very pleasant. You know, it's a leaning towards a three, but it has some pacing issues and whatnot. But I think it's just kind of like, yeah, that's that's fine. It's not really going to bother anybody, I don't think. And I mean, I think, uh, I think I'm probably going to give it three stars. Yeah, I could see that too, you know. Uh, I do think it's a classic. I think it's classic for a reason. Um, I think it influenced a lot of things that came after it, you mm -hmm. know, um, and really what killed it, it is probably going to be the invention of cartoons for toys, you know, cartoons that sell toys. Oh, yeah. You know, this idea of cartoons <laughs> that are, are specifically the Transformers and, yeah. you know. G.I. Joe and uh, all the stuff, you know, Munchie Chi and fucking Dungeons and Dragons and all this stuff that's basically just created to sell you a product. You know, you know Peanuts was, a ne was a never created to sell you a product other than something to give you something to read in a comic book strip. Mm -hmm. You know, it's trying to put it all into three panels, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's the reason 
it's the reason Watterson walked away from it, right? Like yeah. he's just like, look, if you're just going to commercialize my art, not pay me for it, first off, but also do it in a way that I don't want you to do, I'm done. I'm not doing it anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, that's our fault. We don't have any more Calvin and Hobbes. Yeah, and, and Schultz had a a good control over his his uh, work over that fifty years, and then mm -hmm. over the last twenty four years. Uh, they've kept it pretty respectful. I think King's Road Syndicate or whoever it is still owns it. So uh -huh. Peanuts hasn't been bought by Disney or a conglomerate. So it's just been what it should be. That's why that, that 3D rendered movie they did a few years back was more of just based off of old strips and stuff. So they're not ah, really writing okay. new content. They're just right. taking what was there because you got 50 years worth of shit. Mm -hmm. and making more of it i think they did a kid show that was 3d rendered that was on the same concept after the movie where it's like okay we're going to mine the strips or storylines and make that yeah. rather than well i mean if there's i mean if he's got 30 to 40 years of storylines he's got there should be enough there to tell mm -hmm. the right stories it's i i for years have said quietly to people around me <laughs> that i can't believe that nobody's come up with a Calvin and Hobbes script and convinced Watterson to make to mm -hmm. make an animated movie. You know, it's just a, a hand drawn animated movie. It just works in the in the strip. Mm -hmm. I think it's I, I think it's also back to the whole idea of not you know. And if you if you tip make Calvin one money. way or the other, he doesn't come off. Yeah. Right, you know, Calvin has to exist in your mind. <laughs> and yet Charlie Brown was so universal with their characters from abroad, right? Like he's just depressed. He's on the spectrum. She's crazy. She's crushing. And then we have the peppermint patty Marcy situation. We got pig pen. That's a whole thing to unpack right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the little redheaded girl. We haven't even gone into that yet. And then you saw oh, how God, they the published how many, girl. They published all the strips in those hardback books, right? Didn't that take yes. fifteen years or some shit? And there's like forty-five yeah. volumes, or yeah, it's wow, ridiculous. there's a lot to go through. I wish I had the time to sit down and read the whole fifty years. I think I'd be fascinated by just seeing what that would be. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I bet you that's enough of the specials. Yeah, yeah, I bet you that's enlightening to watch him to watch his. Not only his probably his storytelling grow and his, but his also mm -hmm. his art grow. Introducing the new characters, you know, again, Par Peppermint Patty comes from that whole his whole push for Title Nine and this mm -hmm. idea of trying to normalize women playing sports. Because um, weirdly enough, it's you know that's that's that was mm -hmm. not a thing that women did very often. And supposedly the longest continual narrative written by one person. 50 years, one person, same story, nonstop. Sheesh. I don't think anybody else has, has topped that. It's pretty crazy if you think about it in that respect. And mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate this, the comic strip in general, because what a hard thing to do. You have yeah. a couple panels and you have to hit it. And you have to yeah. hit it a couple times a week. Mm -hmm. And people still do it, you know, but it's not the same as when the newspapers were around. I wonder what the yeah, I mean, of a comic strip nowadays. My uh, so I I have a weird perspective on this because my friend's kid he requested for his birthday. I asked him what he wanted for his birthday, and he said I want to get the paper because he had learned about comic book strips. He oh, was reading. Are you telling me this? Yeah. He was reading Garfield. His dad has a bunch of old Garfields, and he was going through them. And his dad was like, "Yeah, these used to come." you used to get these in the newspaper and he's like what are you talking about and he's like yeah there was a whole section called the comics in the newspaper <clears throat> and so i i did i bought him the i bought him the the uh, the sunday run i just bought him the sunday run there's no way i was buying it all daily but uh i bought him the sunday run for a year i think it was i don't know 40 bucks 50 bucks and uh yeah he found that you know there's a whole sunday section he got really into comics and comic books and that whole thing from that he got really <laughs> Um, but I guess there's, so I guess they're still doing them, yeah. you know, it's just, uh, uh, a little different. I remember, you know, when we were in our heavy comic book phase, I'd be mm -hmm. getting a lot of trade paperbacks and collections like that. And so whenever they'd put out like a new 
our side collection or a yeah, oh, Hobbs yeah. or whatever the strip was. Those were always yeah. like those nice, you know. It was a big Life from big Hell was, uh, was the yeah. one that I was extremely excited about when yeah. I found because I was I was reading that oh, yeah. way before oh, Simpsons. Had yeah, Tracy Ullman skits. Mm -hmm. How long ago that was? It's crazy to think. Mm -hmm. I knew Cliff, but Cliff knew me, and there was no TV show called The Simpsons yet. No, isn't that insane? No thing. <laughs> but it's true. It's so true. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm thinking about you know how our rating system on this show and how sometimes it can be all over the place, but I think that's great because between the two of our ratings, you get a good idea of what's good in the movie and what's not good in the movie, right? Yeah. Like if one of them gives it one and the other gives it five. Well, obviously there's something to it, and there's obviously something to it that's probably shitty too. But yeah. always worth watching. Well, and I mean, if you if you tend to agree more with one or the other of us when we're reviewing these, and you've seen these movies, you go, "Oh yeah, I've seen that. He's right." Oh, the old then you know, then you know on the ones that you haven't seen, which one that you probably will agree with, right? Mm -hmm. like, oh, I don't want to see that. He said it was terrible. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, so. Axel F and a boy named Charlie Brown. So I guess that leaves us. So that means next week we have, is that special guest? That was a good <coughs> palate cleanser. Yeah. Next week. Uh, yeah. That was a good one. Do the special guest for them. Let's uh, okay. Let's do the first talking pondo with a guest. Let's try this yes. one that out. Yes. Who, who should we have people? on as the guest? <laughs> Let's bring on Drew. Sure. Why not? Why not? Then, I like it because it mixes it up even more because then you have to wait for his making episode down the line. Yes. I like so, it. So, let's see. Drew, what movie do you want to give us? And then you... He's giving us The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension. Oh, okay. 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 So we're gonna give him. What are we gonna give him? Uh, that that CGI fest from the '80s you were talking about, Escape from New York. <laughs> we'll give him that. <laughs> okay, we'll works for me. Next. Why not? So that'll be next week, and then what's the movies that we're giving each other the week after that? Because right, you know, we need to announce that too <laughs> for reasons. Well, then that's going to be the first ever. Talking Pondo Thanksgiving special. Woohoo! Where we're picking movies that are Thanksgiving themed, I guess. And I th and I think this one's going to come out like really close to Thanksgiving. Yeah, like it's going to be drop November twenty fifth, I think. If yeah, I'm so it'll it'll be it'll be either right after or Thanksgiving right or right before the Monday after or right before Thanksgiving. Yeah, I think it's the that week of like a couple of days before. So, okay. So I got to come up with a Thanksgiving movie to give you, uh, uh planes, trains, no, no, fourth, no, no, fourth, fourth Thursday will be the 22nd. So it'll be the Monday after will be the, the okay. Monday. Well, it's still going to be your Thanksgiving one. Do you, do, how about planes, trains, and automobiles? Is that acceptable for Thanksgiving? I would think that that's a, they're, they're trying to get home for Thanksgiving, home. right? Thanksgiving and it's a child would, abuse movie. We haven't done one of those. Since. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. I'll give you that one. How's that? Okay. All right. I like that. Yeah. That's a good call. I'm going to give you, and, and you can tell me if you agree with this, if you <laughs> think this is a Thanksgiving movie, uh, I'm going to give you Adam's family values. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, I haven't seen it in so long that I'm going to say yes. <laughs> so, I mean, there is a, there is a Thanksgiving play in the movie. Oh, that's right. Yes. Now so, I remember. Yeah. So I think that that's close that's enough to Thanksgiving. Perfectly appropriate. Because picking yes. out the Thanksgiving movies are a little tricky, but cool. They are. We have that laid out. So next week we got our first ever talking with guest with two <laughs> sci-fi classics. And then the episode after that. Or is our Thanksgiving special? And why did we announce the Thanksgiving special now? Because we don't announce it on the Talking with Guest episode. That's why. That's right. We want to let you know what's up so you can watch the movies right. ahead of time. That's right. Trying to, you know, get you guys excited about what's going to happen next. Yeah, we're mixing the format around a bit, you know. Yeah. We got more interesting stuff for you for the rest of the year. 
year's winding down. Then we hit January with episode 50. It's going to be a fun way to start the year. Yes, sir. And boy, has this been a long one. You never know which ones are going to be the long ones. Yeah. Well, you know, I think we had quite a bit. You had, you had quite a bit to say about the Peanuts. I did too. Um, and Axel F itself. Yeah. Um, kind of have to talk was, about the whole series. Jumping into part four is the first one. So. Yeah. Yeah. Part five coming your way. We'll be seeing that in a couple of years. That'll be great. A good Woo-hoo. day to Beverly Hills Cop. Who doesn't want more Eddie Murphy as Axel Foley? Live free or Beverly Hills Cop. Live, live free <laughs> or Axel Foley. Mm-hmm. All right, Marty. Well, I guess until um, well, I guess two weeks from now. Yeah, well, because we're yeah. gonna do the Drew Drew later too. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right then. See you then. All right. Later. Support the show on Buzzsprout for only $3 a month. Give us a five-star review on Spotify or the platform of your choice. And be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube page.